Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shaper Sessions. My name is Jake. And I'm Russ. We've got a super cool episode for you today, and I'm really excited to share this with you. Uh, it's a project that's near to my heart, and it's something that we've been working on here, trying to tweak over the course of the whole last week, and I think we came up with something really good. Um, before we dive too deep into the details, I want to give a little backstory on why we're even doing this episode on sand shading. Um, as Jake said, we've done inlays a lot before. We wanted to take that to the next level and uh, find a method to really give our inlays some depth. The way that this came up for me was that my girlfriend and I were going to a wedding a month ago, and I could not find a bolo tie in the entire city of San Francisco, and I was dead set on wearing a bolo tie to this <laughs> wedding. So what's a guy to do? Make your own. And so I did with inlay, uh, sand shading, and I just want to show this off here. This is the flower inlay that we're going to cut today, but on a little bit bigger of a scale. So you can see that's a columbine flower. That's the state flower of Colorado, where I lived before I moved here. And it's a little bit difficult to tell, honestly. It's very subtly shaded, but we've got a couple examples here that I've cut earlier this week of some other ways that you could shade a similar shape, for example. And uh, we'll show those off, but what do we think about talking about the history of sand shading sure. more broadly? Because it's got a, a deep history in woodworking. Yeah, we put together a couple of slides to talk about that too, but mm -hmm. really where you see it most often is in federal style furniture um, mm -hmm. and specifically in something called the shaded fan inlay which we did mm -hmm. uh, our first our dive first ever into it. sand shading project here i'll actually show this on the bench cam so you can yeah. get another close look at this so that is your kind of classically shaded fan and uh that that element shows up in a lot of federalist furniture so if we wanted to show off a couple components of that mm -hmm. On the slides. Yeah, we've got the slides that we can pull up here, Goose. we got Goose on the switchboard here today. Here we go. Some cool federal furniture. And uh, you see here a lot of these real classic elements that you see if you look at American furniture from, what would you say, the 1800s yeah. or so. Um, a lot of this was done with inlay and marquetry. Uh, you see a lot of natural elements in there. So we've got a rose on the corner leg of this desk, and then we've got what they call bell flowers, are those three-leafed uh, flowers that are dripping down the side of the leg. And I think I see a shaded fan on the front of the desk right there. I think the shaded fan is the most classic. Yeah. And a couple of, of today examples, mm -hmm. modern examples. This was actually a box submission for our 2022 box challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Jack Mock. Jack Mausch. Mausch. And yeah. this one both just like totally blew us away. <laughs> yeah. How 100%. on earth? And he takes this into a lot of his other work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really impressed with his work. It gives a lot of 3D uh, dimensionality to the shape, to the box. And I was blown away by how it's wrapped around that organic form. Yeah. And then one of our favorites, our buddy Ramon, um, who we've had on here to talk about inlay and marquetry in the past. He's done a lot of sand shading as well. And Ramon, I totally stole this off your website, um, but everyone check out Ramon's website, his Instagram, at Ramon Artful. We've got some really tasteful um, shaded flowers. I think the bees' wings are shaded there on the right-hand side. Uh, very subtle, but I love it. You can do a similar thing with leaves. Give the leaves some dimensionality by shading the inside of the leaf. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to add dimensionality with shading later in the show. Yeah, there's a lot of options and really all comes down to time and material on how deep you want that burn to really be. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's a lot of different ways to get kind of a burned texture. There's heat gun, there's a torch, but the mm -hmm. nice thing about sand shading is it's consistent throughout. Like it actually, to the core of your piece, will change the color. So there's a little bit of room for shaping after mm -hmm. the fact. So, mm -hmm. um, And the other cool thing about sh uh, sand shading is you could probably do it with things that you already own. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. All that we used today is a hot plate, a unused old Teflon pan, and the one thing that we didn't have was a bag of sand. Okay, uh, so, a bag of fine sand. Is... So <laughs> a bag of fine sand, but you can find that at almost any hobby or craft store. 
Um, but there are a couple uh, unique characteristics of the sand that you want to keep in mind, right? Jake, you bought the sand for this project. What did you look for when you bought this sand? As fine as you can get. Um, we went with a decor sand, kind of for used for sand art. Mm -hmm. um, really, the finer the grain, the better, because that is that means you'll get more of a consistent gradient, more mm -hmm. even gradient of heat. Um, if you go to the beach and grab the sand off the beach, you're not going to get that same aspect. The granules are too big. So um, I just picked this up on Amazon, decor mm -hmm. sand. And I believe Ted has a link to that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's nice and clean. You are not going to get any of the uh, biodegradable materials that you might find on the beach, which is a big plus. Which right? starts to smell weird, real weird when you have it cranking yeah. in a hot pan. Uh, ours just smells weird because our hot plate uh, we just bought new this week, so it's off-gassing just yeah. a little bit. But uh, it's all good. The reason why we got that hot plate is because we've done this in the past, and the first hot plate that we bought was a little underpowered, honestly. Mm -hmm. It was 1,000 watts, and I shaded maple veneers of a similar size to this, and they took about 20 minutes yeah. each, which is a really long time, with the hot plate cranked all the way up. And with this 1,500-watt hot plate, which Ted also has the link to, uh, these veneers are done in something more on the order of two to four minutes. And I actually did a test um, to find out what length of time I wanted to use for my veneers. So we can pull that up. I've got these samples over here. We can show those on the bench cam, maybe. We've got one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and four minutes. And you can see, as the time lengthens, um, really between one and two minutes is where it really sets off. And then between three and four minutes, not much has changed. But uh, you really want to make sure that you hit the mark on how much shading you want. And uh, if you do a test, that's a, that's a nice, quick, and easy way to find out. We're a big fan of the scientific method here. Exactly. <laughs> Always start with some scrap, figure it out, and then attack your, your final piece. Mm -hmm. another, part of the comp or another component to this whole thing is the pan. We went out and bought a super cheap Teflon pan. Mm -hmm. I think it's an aluminum pan. So the I will I have noticed that the heat is not as uniform as you might want. Mm -hmm. You can the, even see that. Yeah, on you can even veneers. see that. So if we do this up close, I'll take this to the origin cam. You can see that on the right side here, it uh, it's even all the way across, and then you get a dip here where it's much less shaded on that right side and that's consistent across all four test pieces that i did yeah um one of the best things would be for this is to find a cheap cast iron pan go to your mm -hmm. local thrift shop or somewhere where you can just find a beat up one again you're not gonna i would not use this for sand shading and then use it for food yeah just go find yourself a, a cheap sand yeah. shading pan yeah exactly tuck it away we keep ours tucked away in the cabinet when we're not using it and then we bring it out every month or so for something like this yeah so as we're talking about this, so uh, I really do want to show you all the process start to back. Uh, and so we actually have a couple unshaded piece of, pieces of veneer here. Jake, would you mind nesting that in the sand? Do you and, just need uh, one? Just one. And I kind of wiggled it back and forth and nested it all the way to the bottom of the pan. And Goose, if you wouldn't mind, could you start a three-minute timer for us? You want to get it all and the way to the bottom so that you get that nice dark... Mm hmm section yeah perfect Hoping and that's good. Uh, in three minutes you all won't know but jake and i'll get a little notification in our ear from goose that time's up and we'll pull that out um but as we as that shading we can keep talking about what specific processes we follow and what things we've learned uh for sand shading here I saw you just picked up a piece of thin orange veneer. We've yes. also messed around with this a little bit, although we're not going to cut this on the show today. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So traditionally, this method is done with like a super thin veneer, something like this. Um, a go-to material I've seen is holly because of its like brilliant whiteness. Um, mm -hmm. And so the difference between the char is really stark. Mm -hmm. Here at Shaper, we like to do inlays with a little bit thicker material, typically around an eighth of an inch, so mm -hmm. that's why it's going to take a little bit more time. Um, but it also makes for a really stable inlay. With this kind of stuff, it's a real quick process. You just dip it in. Um, I did a couple of tests, and I'm not going to try to count in my head because I can't talk and count at the same time. 
but around 15 to 30 seconds, depending on how far you want that gradation to come up. But it does mm -hmm. go really, it goes a lot faster, and I've noticed it travels a lot farther when the material is thin. Mm -hmm. When you have a denser material, yeah, it doesn't quite creep up as much. Absolutely. The species of wood has a lot to play in that effect as well. Very um, true. So you see over on the left side, I have a couple of samples here um, that I did this week before the show. And one is completely unshaded. Two more are shaded in maple. And a third, you might not tell by looking at it, but it's shaded in cherry, actually. Um, and the reason that that's a little tricky is that it's the very light sapwood of the cherry. And what that turned out as, hey since the cherries... Oh, boy. <laughs> Too <Since> far. <laughs> that's good. That's good, though. That's a nice gradient on that one. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's hold this up to the origin cam here. This is about 15 or 20 seconds on this 142nd of an inch veneer here. Um, the cherry is much less dense than the maple, and so it's shaded very differently. And so if you would pass me the cherry and one of the maple samples, looking up close, you can definitely see the difference in this. I'll hold this one up to the origin cam first. This is cherry. The char on this one is blacker, I think. The gradient is sharper, and it has a little bit of a green tinge to it, whereas the maple here... I think has a more brown black char to it. Um, the gradient is wider. And overall, I think it didn't burn as much because that maple is denser. Yeah. So you can play around with that. That's another aspect that you can play with when you're practicing sand shading because there's a lot of practice that goes into this and experimentation. I heard a timer, so I'm going to pull this out very carefully. Yeah, there we go. That you looks like great. That? I like that. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Careful because they're hot. Very hot. Uh, we do I'll have tweezers. I didn't tell you that I brought <laughs> tweezers over for this. So you can see just after three minutes, hold this one up to the origin cam here. You've got that nice gradient across. And I flipped this around backwards. But you can see, just like we expected from before, we've got a little dip in the gradient there. But that's OK. We can work with that. Cool. Now, you might notice that we have shaded everything before we've cut in this example. Uh, and that's another factor that you can play around with. Do you shade before or after you cut? And there are pros and cons to either, right? Yeah, it seems like for like this flower design, you'd want to potentially do it after so you had a little bit more control of where it is. But mm -hmm. you got to think about how deep you have to bury it in the sand. So if you have a little part, it might be mm -hmm. kind of difficult. And because of origin and the vision system, we have the ability to see what we're working on and place our files exactly where we want that gradation gradation to be yeah exactly which i think is the best way to go about it and also you notice some movement too right right yeah so the one thing that i learned when i cut my bolo tie so i cut these parts first and then actually sand shaded them after the fact and if we go back to the origin cam here you can see these gaps or these dark lines between the petals of the flower those are shrinkage. Um, I actually test fit this before I sand shaded it, and it fit exactly line on line. I used offsets to get a nice tight fit. And then after uh, the parts were sand shaded, they had lost so much moisture in the process that they shrank. Now, in this case, I think that's a good thing because it allowed me to add a little bit more contrast in between the flower petals with some dark wood dust. I just glued that in. But if you really wanted that line on line fit, I would recommend either uh, shading first and then cutting after, or somehow adding the moisture back into your wood. I actually, when I was researching for this show, I heard a little story about uh, old-time woodworkers who would put their sand-shaded parts in their mouth just for 15 seconds after they sand-shaded them to bring the moisture back. And we don't recommend that here, especially <laughs> not with this, uh, this cool crazy dyed science veneer. orange dyed veneer. But uh, if that you're comfortable fun, with that, then more power to you. That will that might bring your pieces right back up to size. Yeah. All right. Well, we have our piece. Um, uh, yeah. I think that's everything that we actually wanted to talk about as far as how we do it. Yeah. kind of covers the bases. I want to just show this one off because this, is, I think, is the perfect level of shading. Mm -hmm. I like this one. Compared to the non-shaded. And then we also have a non-shaded example. So I'll show the non-shaded example on the origin screen. And uh, 
it's nice. It's a very nice inlay, and I tried to do the best that I could with the grain direction, but overall it looks flat. Less so up close, um, especially so at something like six feet away. Now, this is the exact same flower with just a little bit of shading, what I like to call a tasteful amount of shading. Uh, our buddy Sean here at Shaper HQ suggested, Russ, go all out on the shading. <laughs> and this is what the all out shading looks like. So I'll call this the Sean method. Um, up close, I think the more subtle shading looks better. But where I think the Sean method of shading shines is something like uh, a cabinet that you might look at from farther away, six feet away. You really actually need more contrast in the shading to make yeah. it pop. So different shading for different applications as well. For the top of a jewelry box, I wouldn't want to go so hard on the shading. I would want to keep it definitely subtle. Um, but for something that you're going to look at from farther away, you can go a little harder on it. Make that char a little bit darker. Yeah. And for this one, uh, the general size is actually sized for a belt buckle. We're going to... Mm -hmm. Uh, hardware hasn't come in yet, but we are going to in inlay this into a belt buckle. So we're going all Western today. <laughs> it's going to have all a together. whole vibe. I'm going to wear the bolo, and Jake's going to wear the belt <laughs> buckle on the next session. Just you watch. Um, so, with all that said, we're going to cut this whole project start to finish with Origin today. It's pretty quick. We're going to show you one of my favorite things about Origin, which is that you get to place the files on screen as you go with an image of where that shading and where that grain is. So that'll really help you work with that shading and use it to its fullest effect. Um, and it's going to honestly be kind of quick today because we're not going to do things like gridding. Um, I'm pretty much already set up with Workstation here. We're going to highlight that one feature that we don't use as often as I would like, which is really using the origin camera and that scan image to frame what you're doing, which I think is like really one of the greatest features. Yep. So uh, let's get it going. I already have workstation all set up here with the shelf height and everything. I'm just going to apply some double-sided tape to my workstation shelf. If you want to know more about setup, then please go back and watch our Origin Pro Tips session, which we filmed two weeks ago. And we'll go into everything you want to learn about setup and more. Got a double-sided tape. I'm going to let's see. I'm going to place this with the shaded side towards me. Press it down, and I already have the height of this shelf set up at the perfect height from earlier practice with this, so I know it's all good to go. I can ride Origin over that surface, and there are no dips or anything. I am going to go in and take a new scan so that I get the image of this part with the shading so that I can place my files relative to that shading exactly where I want. Quick question on scanning. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to get an even more kind of top-down view of mm -hmm. that grain pattern, you could have tipped your origin forward Absolutely. a bit? Absolutely. I could have tipped origin forward a little bit. And that's one of those pro tips that we cover in that pro tip session. Go back and watch that on demand. Absolutely. I'm in design mode. I'm going to import this. I've already got this folder all set up. And now the thing that I want to keep track of is which petal am I looking at? So I've got this shape on origin screen. On this flower, I think that that is the top petal of the bolo. That fits. And looking at this shaded example, I want that shading to be on the leftmost side of that part. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rotate this by negative 90 degrees just to get it approximately right. So looking at those two things side by side, that's what I'm working with. And then I'm going to bring that down. And now I can see my sand shading. I want this to be subtle. I'm not going all in on the sand shading down here at the darkest part. I'm going to keep it subtle and up here. The other thing that I want to do to make this bigger for Jake's belt buckle is scale. And this is a new feature that we released with Inverness. When I say new, I mean almost a year old at this point. If you haven't updated to Inverness, our latest software release, please do so. You're missing and, out. Uh, it's life changing. You get this scale feature. So we're going to take this from a bolo to a belt buckle without having to go to the computer and modify our files. So I'm going to place that right there. 
and I'm going to continue. Pedal one, pedal two, we're going clockwise around this flower, and I want this shading to be on this side of this one. So again, I'm gonna rotate this by, let's say, negative 45, scale by two, and I'll place that here. Import petal three. This one's already facing the right direction for where I want it. I'm gonna place that one here. Petal four. Again, scale. Oops, lost it. Times two. There we go. I'm going to get just a little bit of that one again. I think that's a little bit close, actually. So I'm going to move that over, delete the original, and then the last petal. Again, times two. There we go. That's it. That's as easy as it is to place those files. No gridding, no positioning, um, all very organic. Just following your intuition um, and some practice, in our yeah. case, and finding what suits you. Before I get too far into cutting this, I want to make sure that I have plenty of clearance. I'm using a quarter-inch cutter for this one. Eighth-inch cutter? Eighth-inch cutter. That's exactly right. Misspoke. Always remember to Z-touch. And I forgot to tighten the spindle collar. But it's okay because See, it origin... still happens to us. <laughs> I know. So always remember to tighten your spindle collar, everyone. Um, it does happen. You'll get a bad Z height, and you'll get a chattery cut. Let's try that again. Such a happy accident with the, uh, the outlines. I think it's such a cool. Yeah, it turned out pretty well. And then based on my previous practice, I know that I can do this in one cut straight to negative 0 0.002 offset, and that's going to be good. That's confidence. It is confidence. <laughs> I mean, I've done one, two, three, four, five of these flowers so far, and I would say that I would be confident taking this to my grandmother's tabletop and Ooh, like inlaying a flower on top of each leg. A whole bouquet. Federal style. Yeah, a whole bouquet. Exactly. You're really going at it with that, uh, I'm just having with fun that orange here. piece. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm hogging the mic here. Um, while, I, while I get set up for this, actually, not while I get set up for this, I'm ready to cut. It was that simple. Yeah, um, get going. So I'm going to get going. Maybe you could tell everyone again about the Q&A, giveaway, et cetera, et cetera. Give people a reminder. We're Let's about halfway it. through at this point. I'm not going to leave this in there, though. All right. I'll wander over here. So I can hopefully see what Russ is cutting. All right. So I noticed that he's going straight in with that negative 0.002 offset. What I'm wondering is if he's also going to apply a slight offset to the pocket, too. Maybe a little bit of off of each to bring everything together nicely. But this is the type of inlay that has multiple factors. It's not one solid piece going into a pocket. It's multiple pieces coming up next to each other. So you have to make room between them too. So that two thou off each piece equals four thou total. And that's gonna be just perfect. And quick reminder, we got our giveaways going on at the end of the show. We're gonna do an eighth inch collet, roll of double-sided tape, and a swag pack. Please answer that question. We're very curious what your favorite style of furniture is. Whatever the question is.
You'll notice too, when you're starting to work with thinner materials, things like a straight flute bit versus an upcut bit might behoove you. Because it, you don't need the amount of chip clearance that an upcut bit offers uh, because the material is so thin and it might give you less of a fuzzy edge. That fuzzy edge can always be sanded off really easily, but when you're doing a bunch of tiny little parts, that can become quite cumbersome. And of course, there's down cutting bits. Typically, like to stay away from down cutting bits just because it presses all of the chips downwards. But again, for thin materials, you can you can get away with it from time to time. And we highly recommend if you are looking to get into inlays and want to get that fine detail, ready to dive into the fine detail life, look, check out our store where you'll find the 8th inch collet. And that opens up a whole new world of 8th inch shank bits that you can buy at a variety of small sizes. All right, we're all set. Cowbunga. We got that on the workstation cam. Let's uh, let's peel this up. I think the one thing that I did forget to bring today was the uh, the palette knife for the scraper. But I didn't press this down too hard, so should be able to just bring that right up. That's not too bad. Thank you, Jake. We got that. And let's just take a look at this first piece. Hold that up to the origin cam here. Very subtle shading but you can tell the difference between that subtle shading and just a plain piece of maple here. So it adds just a little bit of texture to your inlay, but not too much. I'm a subtle guy. I'm not an over the top guy, I'm a subtle guy. So I like just a little bit of shading, just a nice little touch. Peel these off. And my process for cleaning these off has been to hit them with that stiff haired brush, stiff bristle brush. There we go. And, uh, and then to hit them with just a needle file, not even sandpaper, mm. even. Just a little bit of needle file to take any remaining burr off of the part because I don't want to change the dimension of the part at all. I don't want to soften it. I just want to that is knock perfect. the little fuzzies off, you know? Do you, do you feel confident with me doing that while you cut the pocket? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For anyone that's wondering, Gordon Brush Commerce, these are really wonderful th th tough bristle brushes. We have a ton of them around the shop. Great for mm -hmm. engraving. Yeah, and we just get those on McMaster Car, right? I believe so. Mm -hmm. I hope. I know. Throw, throw Ted a curveball if you have that link safe somewhere. Perfect. Peel this double-sided tape off. I can't tell you all how much I love this double-sided tape. We're gonna stick a little bit more down and then just zip out a quick pocket out of a piece of walnut that I have here for this bolo tie or for this, uh, what's gonna be a belt buckle inlay. We're gonna shape this after the fact because we don't have the belt buckle here with us. So we're gonna cut this out of a solid block and then Jakey's going to have a little bit of sanding to do <laughs> next week, but he'll deal. There we go. That's pretty good. Drop the shelf down. I always like to level with the support bar here. Bring that shelf back up so that it's nice and flush and square. There we go. And you could either add to scan at this point or make a new scan to scan this walnut in. I'm just going to make a new scan. It's a little bit easier <clears> for me to do that. It gets rid of all of your old designs as well at the same time making a new scan. Whereas adding to scan keeps a lot of those cut paths and design files. So I'm just going to clear those all out by making a new scan here. 
and then I'm going to take my design, Bolo Pocket here, scale it up again, times two. And we just want that flower, so it's not a big deal that the rest of it is overhanging the edge. I'm just going to drop that right in the middle. So you can see we've got a pocket here. Once I cut that pocket out, I'm going to change that to an inside cut, and then we'll just do a nice trim of the inside of that flower, bring it right to size. Before I do that, I'm going to switch, though, to my quarter inch cutter, just to maintain the process that I did earlier. The eighth inch cutter would absolutely work. It would leave a nice clean surface, but I used the quarter inch cutter when I was practicing this earlier this week. And your offsets are dependent on not just your material and the design file, but if you want to maintain your offsets from project to project with the most accuracy, I recommend using the same cutter too, because you never know um, if that might, the stiffness of the cutter might influence that cut a little bit in the pocket or in that finished cut. So I'm going to make sure that I use the exact same thing every time. Don't want to remove that. I must have just brushed that while I was changing the spindle. All right, perfect. We've got that design file in. I am going to change my cutter diameter to a quarter inch. Z-touch. And I remember to clamp my spindle this time, so that's good. And same as before, I'm going to use an eighth inch depth of cut. I am going to use a two thousandths offset on this because that's what I used in the past and it worked. So I'm going to just go straight to that and keep it. I don't want to do a test fit with this because these pieces are so small. They are prone to breaking a little bit. When you get to sm such small part sizes as this, they can get a little fragile. So I'm just going to stick with what I know and cut this pocket. Shall we? Let's do it. All We're right. having a great time over here. So. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Right. <laughs> now I can't see exactly what he's doing, but for pockets like this, I always, I always like to start in the middle and kind of work my way out in a circular motion. You'll also notice this design has kind of a little island in the middle, the center of the flower. This is a really good tactic, too, when you start getting into larger inlays um, and you need a little bit of support for the bottom of origin to ride on, maybe incorporating whatever it is that you're inlaying into and creating kind of an island. An example of that is the 12-pointed star inlay on Shaper Hub. Whole middle section is just supposed to be left behind. We have another ex uh, exciting thing to show you, something that Russ has been working on. I believe he has, uh, he, he made his own hand tool and we're gonna use that to kind of trim things down after we press everything into place. Okay, not too bad. A little fuzzy. That's to be expected when you're going across the grain. You can see I've got a lot more fuzziness across the grain than I do when I'm going with the grain. Um, and we should 
pare a little bit of this out with a chisel also because we've got a little bit of fuzz down here where I must not have gotten quite tight enough with the pocket. I want to make sure that all my inlay pieces stay nice and flush. And I think Jake's coming to save me with a little piece of sandpaper here too. Perfect. So we'll just finish this off and you can see that edge quality really pop. There we go. Another hit with the vacuum. Peel this off. Love having this nice sharp putty knife for removing things from double-sided tape and you can see it just releases super cleanly and that's what we're looking at for the pocket right there. Nice clean lines. Um, how are the pedals coming, Jake? Pedals done. Okay. Uh, hope you can remember which side goes up. Well, we've got a couple <laughs> examples here. They are pretty tricky, the bottom one especially, but most oh, of these <laughs> most of these are pretty directional. Let's see. This little one, yeah, that's correct right there. I'll just lay these all out. So we're going to put a little bit of glue in here. We're going to glue this whole thing up right now. We're going to put a little bit of glue in this pocket, brush it around a little bit. Actually, while I'm organizing these, you can do that. We'll press it all in. We'll plane it off because the fit should be like spot on. These pieces aren't going to be loose at all. They're just going to be held in by friction. They're going to get solidified as that glue dries. Um, we'll plane the top off, and you all can just see how we did. I'll move this to the bench cam so everybody can get a little interactive time watching me organize these pedals. I've got one at the bottom here and I'm just trying to make sure that they match this part that I already did earlier. Here we go. That's that part right there and if I do it right they're all gonna fit together. This should be this part right here. There we go. That's good. This one I can tell by the shading. This one goes here or does it? Yep, that's perfect. That's good fit. These are bouncing around a little bit just because they're so light. And then this last one, I changed the shading on this one to make it look a little more subtle. So that one goes right there. So we're all set, Jake. Cool. The ultimate test is whether the person who did not design or cut the project <laughs> can assemble it. <laughs> Thank you for And the I've got purple. a pair of tweezers over there for you if you want them tweezers huh yeah they're small parts these are uh less than a gram each i'm sure okay i'm not gonna go all the way in with everything yet okay i feel like i'm they like, should all be able to go right in they each only really have one spot because they're constrained both by the outside of the flower and that little nub in the middle which i left to give the the center of the flower a little bit of contrast and I, I missed this. I couldn't hear it. But what was the offset that you used on the pocket? I used minus point zero zero two. Okay, so everything, everything has a two thou. Mm -hmm. How's that fit feeling? <laughs> really good. Nice. Yeah, this is this is why we're here. Mm -hmm. And the pocket ideally should be a little bit deeper than the inlay parts. At least that's how I intended to cut it. So we'll see how it turns out when we glue it all together. Oh, interesting. You like to have the pocket a little deeper just for this just because it's uh you know a little more protected i've got the grain going a lot of different directions on that inlay is the reason why i did that they're not all going the same way so i thought if they're encased by the walnut all going the same direction then i'd be less likely to get any tear out when that's planed that is satisfying yeah. there i can't go. believe you let me do that that was yeah incredible. How do you feel? <laughs> that's good let's let's the move best it part. up to the origin cam there we go that's an inlay. Let's, uh, we'll get some of these fuzzies off if we just plane it real quick. I just want any excuse possible to use this little hand plane. I know. I talked it up. You want to do the honors? Oh, no. This is you. Okay. Cool. So, got this little hand tool bench. We'll do a little, little quick plane action. There we go. Sweet. That is a tasteful shade. Mm-hmm. Oh, I lost a little bit on this one. That's why I wanted it to be under the under the uh, walnut. Y'all can see that. Learn from my mistakes. 
I think if we plane that down just a little bit more, that tear out would go away. Scrape it or sand it always. But this comes back to a fact that I love about sand shading, which you got, which you touched on earlier, which is that when you sand shade, uh, that shading actually goes all the way through the thickness of the part. And this was something that when we were practicing earlier, we weren't even sure about. Um, it kind of made intuitive sense to me that the shading would be on the outside of the piece of wood and might not actually come all the way into the center on an eighth inch thick piece of wood. But we took a piece to the bandsaw and it was dead even all the way through what it looked like on the outside, it looked like on the inside. So yeah. sand without fear is yeah. what I say. Exactly. Shape and sand away. Yeah. Um, you have anything to add to this one, Jake? That's it. I was kind of wrapped up. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited to turn this into a belt buckle. We will make sure to post that on IG. Mm -hmm. We'll share yep. it off in the, in the stories and on live. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, let's see. We learned about some furniture history today. We learned about some cool contemporary sand shaders that you can follow. All the tips on how we do it. Cut a sand shaded columbine inlay from start to finish. And you can find that project on Shaper Hub. Ted's got the link. Same for that federal uh, shaded fan inlay that we mm -hmm. did on that box as well. We've got a project for that too. So check those out. And if you do some of your own sand shading and you have an Instagram, post it with that hashtag ShaperMade because we want to see it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excited. If you're watching this on demand, join us live every other Thursday where we dive into Q&A and giveaways. We hope you learned something and we hope that it was worth it. I think it was. Thank you.